Support for Conversations with Elle McFarlane was provided by Old National Bank Comcast Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance and North American Banking Company. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. This edition of Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by Comcast, working to bridge the digital divide through internet essentials and partnering with organizations across Twin Cities to help make our region an even better place to live, work, and play. Organizations like Big Brothers and Big Sisters of Twin Cities. I'm pleased to have as guest today uh, the Chief Executive Officer, Michael Gore, and a colleague, Justin Fogel. Justin is the volunteer manager. Uh, Michael, good to see you again. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, Al. Good to see you. It's good to have you here and glad that you're part of this conversation. Let me share uh, some of your bio to our listeners and, and viewers. Uh, Michael Gore began as CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters Twin Cities in June of 2016. Um, and he's got an extensive background in education and youth development including serving as CEO and interim superintendent of Minneapolis Public Schools prior to leading Big Brothers Big Sisters Twin Cities. Uh, his work at the school district included launching the Office of Black Male Achievement. Previously, he was executive director of Generation Next, a Minneapolis-based youth development organization that works to close the achievement gap. Earlier in his career, uh, Michael Gore held executive positions and COO roles for both Boston Public Schools and Memphis City Schools. Uh, Michael, you've got a degree, uh, a BA in uh, Business uh, Administration and uh, Urban Studies from the University of Wisconsin River Falls, a master's degree in Public Administration from Mankato State University, and Superintendent Licensure, and uh, multiple leadership development program certification, certifications uh, at Harvard University. So you're an active community member, passionate about giving back. You're on boards of several important organizations, including Genesis Works, uh, Black Men Teach, and MIA, the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Uh, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having us. Good to see you again. Uh, and Big Brothers Big Sisters, Twin Cities, a legacy and powerful important organization. Uh, give us the snapshot vision mission, uh, the value proposition that the organization brings to community. Sure, sure. So uh, we are a organization that was founded back in 1920. Uh, so in uh, next year, we're going to be turning 100 years old, wow. believe it or not. So during that time, we have served over half a million youth in our community. So pre predominantly our core essence of our work it's been really our surrounding issues of youth development, youth mentoring. So we started our uh, pathway in early days in terms of one-to-one -one mentoring. So, um, you know, I don't know, Al, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be here if I did not have a great mentor in my life. And, uh, and she still guides me in terms of my career path. And I check in, went to my, check in with my mentor every day as well. So a lot of our kids in our community that don't have that sort of caring adult. Mm -hmm. Um, providing them with sort of kind of the guidance. So our job, our core mission is to provide that, mm -hmm. especially for youth uh, who are deemed in a, by our community or by our uh, sort of state as at risk. And so that is our core constituent youth that we seek and to support. And we support uh, by uh, securing a volunteer mm -hmm. to engage with that youth in terms of one-to-one -one mentoring relationship. And then um, along with that, we have sort of other sort of uh, methodology of uh, youth development, which includes group mentoring. So not all kids resonate with one-to-one -one or adults for that matter. So we get into group mentoring. Then we also do extensive work on college readiness because we strongly believe that the work that we're engaging with our youth should lead to a very specific outcome, which is one of the big measures that we're engaged in is high school graduation rate. We want to make sure a youth that we serve in our community graduate from high school. That's sort of key indicator number one 
From there, then we want to ensure that our youth who are graduating from high school have an options beyond high school. So it may be four years or maybe two year institutions or it may be directly into working pipeline. And our job in Big Brothers Big Sister is, is, is nurturing those sort of vision and unlocking the potential of our youth because we strongly believe all kids in our community are just one caring adult away from becoming an amazing positive story. Wow. Okay? Wow. So I truly believe that in my heart of heart because I experienced it mm -hmm. as a youngster growing up in South Minneapolis and as an adult uh, who, who had received many guidance from many different adults mm -hmm. and I feel strongly that that is sort of big gap that exists in our community and I truly as a, an educator, a uh, former educator, do take this to, my, uh, to our sort of who I am, my DNA, which is our job in Big Brothers Big Sisters to really reduce or eliminate the mm -hmm. opportunity gap that exists mm -hmm. in our community. So we are very proud of our long traditional tradition of history, but we're more, more importantly, we are really proud of the work that is underway. We have amazing um, group of board members, amazing uh, staff, and most recently in 2018, we served close to 4,000 youth in our community. So our work is sort of metropolitan area. So we are the largest uh, mentoring organization in the state of Minnesota. And um, there are yet uh, hundreds, of, if not thousands of kids to be served in our community. And we have a huge waiting list. So Al, one of the things that we are really uh, looking forward to connecting uh, with your listening and what uh, your audience is, we are always looking for more volunteers. That's mm -hmm. one of the things that Justin, my colleague here, is in charge of, because what lacks of our <clears> ability <throat> to serve more kids really would be sort of getting more adults to say, yeah, I commit to being a mentor to a child and have that opportunity. Well, you know, with the 100 years of service, you guys have this mentoring thing down to a science. Mm -hmm. And you've learned some things about what it takes to be a mentor, how you do the mentoring work, yeah. uh, working with either one child or working with groups of children yeah. or groups of mentors. So yeah. you've looked at the spectrum yeah. of uh, ways to be of value and to bring that uh, nurturing mm -hmm. uh, into uh, the life of a young person. Mm -hmm. And so one of the challenges now I think you're saying uh, is that we simply need more people from all communities, yeah. but our community in particular, yeah. to step up. Yeah. and to be part of this process. How, how do you do that? Justin, what, what's the message? How do you recruit uh, people to join the organization to become mentors? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a great question. And I think um, just what Michael is alluding to is that our, our program, our mission, this value proposition, as you say, it grows you know, in direct proportion to how many people uh, volunteer. Mm -hmm. And some of the new and exciting things that have come on on board in the last year is this new offering of programs. So um, we have a little bit for everyone, uh, whether it's a long-term one-to-one commitment, whether it's uh, mentoring in the arts for a shorter term period. Uh, we believe that this, this way of volunteering, that there's a little bit in, in it for everyone. You're also locating your organization into North Minneapolis too. Yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, just to piggyback on uh, what Justin said and, and talk about our location, I think it is critical um, that we also have sort of wide spectrum of volunteers coming into our organization. And just reason that is so important for us in making sure that all community is represented as a, a volunteers is that a vast majority of our kids that we serve are kids of color mm -hmm. and uh, disproportionately. Um, close to 85% of our kids. And that's nothing bad about that because we they, they need our services mm -hmm. and we're there to provide our services. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we're working really hard is to sort of volunteers from all segments and all community to participate. Mm -hmm. We don't want one community to overrepresent that particular community and other community to be under underrepresented. Mm -hmm. So we're working really hard mm -hmm. to make sure that we do active community engagement to ensure that we diversify mm -hmm. our volunteers. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is sort of <clears throat> conclusive nature of our work is sort of both uh, race mm -hmm. and gender. Mm -hmm. 
and an age as well. Mm -hmm. So we're a very inclusive organization. We value mm -hmm. wisdom of, of sort of adults who's been around, mm -hmm. understanding what is needed to be successful in life. What are some of the barriers to getting, say, black or Latino or Asian parents and adults to, to come? Is it a question of making the proper invitation? Do they fully know and understand uh, what the organization does and how they can support it? What do you think are yeah. some of the challenges? I think it's a multitude of challenges. Mm -hmm. I think that we have not not very good job mm -hmm. as, a, as an organization to really um, speak uh, uh, to our community members mm -hmm. about a uh, value of Big Brothers Big Sisters. Mm -hmm. So I think that we are sort of retooling how we communicate mm -hmm to a very specific community, um, especially in volunteer perspective, sure. because we get a lot of calls or uh, uh, referrals from a lot of our parents. And our parents are very much interested in seeking that sort of mentoring support. Um, but also they you know, have indicated level of interest of, hey, if my, I would like to have African-American African male mm -hmm. between age of this and this. Mm -hmm. There are some parents are very specific sure. in terms of what they're looking for. Sure. So we are sort of kind of revamping how we communicate, mm -hmm. how we talk about sort of volunteerism mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. our organization. And I realize sort of lots of folks are involved and there are many amazing opportunities to mm -hmm. volunteer. Mm -hmm. We think that our work has a tremendous impact because you can see immediate result. You're spending time mm -hmm. with another human being mm -hmm. and that human being is going to give you feedback immediately about sure. connection or lack thereof. So one of the things that you talked about, so when I started our, our work is looked at kind of where yeah. are we physically <clears throat> present? Mm -hmm. You know, that also makes a difference. So currently right now we are in, in a place I feel like that really people don't understand or community don't understand sort of connection between us and the work itself. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we have done through our strategic planning and meeting with our board and meeting with our staff is say, hey, given the opportunity that our lease in current space is gonna run out in a year or two, mm -hmm. let's think ahead. I think we should be in the community where people could see, tangibly see, mm -hmm. that we are a, a large nonprofit with a large footprint, not some sort of profit that is sort of off someplace else and come down once in a while <clears throat> or talk to our uh, our kids. I think that sort of is a perception. Mm -hmm. We want to dispel that perception. Uh, this is neither imperial nor missionary, right? <laughs> yeah. right. You want to reflect the reality of being in and of yeah. the community, yeah. uh, intertwined, yeah. connected, knitted yeah. tightly. Yeah. Yeah. And Absolutely. to do that, you're going to actually Put yourself physically yeah. in a way that you haven't been before. Yeah, I think it it will. I think it will enhance um, the way we think, and but more importantly, that I think community, our opportunity to connect with the community, be far more powerful. Mm -hmm. And we we are an organization that is very blessed, and we are not just a mentoring organization. We are youth development organization mm -hmm. that happen to use mentoring as a tool. Right. Right. So. We have been engaging with stakeholders, so we are we are moving. There was sort of that was sort of a a statement that we made mm -hmm. with the board uh, uh, support, and now we are really pleased to say that we're going to be moving to North Minneapolis, and we are uh, next week we'll be closing on our building. And yeah, thank you. Yeah. And uh, now hard part, Alice, I got to raise money. There we go. All right, hey, so. Uh, <laughs> That work is underway, and we have an amazing board that is helping mm -hmm. us and moving that uh, moving that needle. But we are very comfortable and very happy, and our mm -hmm. team are very excited. Mm -hmm. The prospect of being in the community mm -hmm. and being involved mm -hmm. and be part of the community is so important well, to so us. So let's talk about how do you resource organizations like that. Uh, you go to the corporate community, you go to individuals, to churches, to ind to uh, you know, what are the sources do you yeah. have to to fund this yeah. important work? Our organization is, is exclusively funded through private donations mm -hmm. and corporate and foundational donation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're pursuing other funding opportunity mm -hmm. with state and mm -hmm. other, other entities, but right now, the revenue that we, uh, we get is through partnerships. It's about talking to of corporate funders, mm -hmm. individual funders, mm -hmm. saying, hey, we are big brothers, big sisters, and we're doing X, Y, and Z. Here's our outcome. Right. And we would like you to fund our organization. So we are we are doing that right now. And then also we're exploring opportunity for private public oppor uh, funding opportunity collaboration, because right. I think there are sort of resources that I think that we are also pursuing at state level, 
We think that we have amazing results. Mm -hmm. We think that we can serve a lot more kids. Mm -hmm. And what hold us back are two things, which are volunteers mm -hmm. and money. So the question is, how can people get involved with both? Yeah. What do you need to do? How, mm -hmm. Let's make the invitation to our listeners and to our viewers. How do they get involved to support this important work? Yeah. So I'll, I'll have Justin talk about sort of <coughs> what does it mean to be a volunteer in our organization? Yeah. So first and foremost, just to piggyback on the earlier conversation about moving and being more community-based, mm -hmm. um, throughout this next year, we have a goal to do a lot of our just kind of initial information sessions where people can learn a little bit more in depth, ask questions about our program. We're gonna be hosting those at uh, gathering spaces in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. So libraries, uh, common um, places where people gather, we're going to be there and those will be listed on our website actually. Uh, so people can look for those over the next upcoming months. Um, and then we have programs too. Um, one of the biggest needs is in our community-based program, uh, the traditional one-to-one -one long term mentorship. But then I want people to know too that we're involved in a lot of schools um, in Minneapolis, in St. Paul, a um, handful of schools, handful of community-based nonprofits that we partner with mm -hmm. for what we call the free arts program. Mm. And that's a really great way for people to connect right in their local community. And these are areas where people may not have necessarily even known that uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters has quite a presence. So lots of ways to plug into local schools, nonprofits, community, um, and all of that information is available on our website. Website is? www.bigstwincities.org. There we go. I love that yeah. bigs, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Listen, gentlemen, we're out of time, but thank you so much for your work. Thank you for being here. Continued success in this important work. Uh, Justin Fogel, volunteer manager, Michael Gore, CEO of uh, Big Brothers and Big Sisters Twin Cities. Thank you. Thank you. Continued thank you. success. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. This edition of Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by Comcast, working to bridge the digital divide through internet essentials and partnering with organizations across Twin Cities to help make our region an even better place to live, work, and play. And uh, one of the partnerships is with uh, my guest today, uh, guest representing the Boys and Girls Club of Twin Cities. Terrell Brum is the president and CEO of Boys and Girls Clubs of Twin Cities. She joined the organization in 1997, mm -hmm. and you've worked in pretty much every job in the yeah, organization, it looks to me, <laughs> including uh, program uh, areas and administration, for example, as director of individual and family services. You've worked as executive assistant to the president. You've been director of human resources, director of special events, the area director for North Minneapolis, and you most recently were vice president of development and communications. Uh, before joining the clubs, you worked in special education mm -hmm. with the Minneapolis Public Schools. You've got a BA in child psychology from University of Minnesota and an MBA uh, in business administration from University of Phoenix. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. Thanks for having us. Your colleague here, your, your partner, uh, Crystal Beter. Crystal is the academic director, 15 years experience in curriculum design and programming in school and nonprofit settings. Uh, you've been with uh, Boys and Girl Clubs of Twin Cities since 2017. Previously, you worked as a program director in one of the clubs, and uh, you are a licensed secondary English teacher, you've got a master's degree in education, uh, curriculum instruction from University of Minnesota. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, you are a legacy institution uh, Boys and Girls Clubs 20, Twin Cities, mm -hmm. major organization, a major fixture, asset, resource for our mm -hmm. community. Uh, start off by just sharing the value proposition, the vision and mission of the clubs. Yeah, our, our mission is to enable all young people, especially those who need us the most, to reach their full potential, is responsible, 
caring, um, and productive citizens. But for us, it's really that reaching that full potential that in most recent years has become so important. Um, we really want to make sure that we provide the right resources because ultimately our vision is that kids graduate on time with a plan for the future, living that healthy lifestyle and demonstrating good character and citizenship throughout their entire life. So our goal is taking those kindergartners all the way through post-secondary and making sure they have those resources and those opportunities to be amazing and be the best that they can be. So, What's the scale, scope of the organization? How, how big, how many kids, uh, well, families do you work with? Yeah, so we have um, over 8,000 kids mm -hmm. that sign up to be members on, a, on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. um, we've got close to, um, right now we're edging up to 900 kids a day that are attending the club. Mm -hmm. um, really divided between boys and girls, and it has been for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of shifts between you know 49 to 51 in any given year. Um, and we've had a growth in the last few years of our teen population, as well as our kindergarten through third graders. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the diversity of our, of our kids represent the neighborhoods that we're in. We have eight clubs, um, and we're in communities where kids need us the most, um, where there's primarily a lack of resources to, for parents to pay for after school and where parents and guardians are working often multiple jobs and they need a really great, great place for their kids to go that's safe, but a place that's also gonna make sure that their kids are reaching that full potential mm -hmm. and really challenging them to be their best and connecting back with the schools. What do kids do with the boys and girls clubs? Well, there's been a big shift in the last few years. Crystal and I partnered, so she was with us in 2015-16, and as I took on this role, we really wanted to take a deep dive into academic success, mm -hmm. but it needed to be fun as well and engaging for the kids. We also knew that our kids were, in some ways, there was a lot of trauma that our kids were going through, so we wanted to invest in edu education and social emotional learning at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, we still have gyms, we still have social recreation centers, but a pro most of the work that we're doing is really around skill building, fun skill building in the space of education. So STEM, literacy, um, in 2016, we, took, um, we started a, a new literacy initiative for K3, and Crystal can talk a lot about that. But partners in that are Harvard Pair Institute, we use for our assessment data. Um, and most recently, we shifted to using um, a school-based um, assessment tool. The actual program model, though, has been created. Crystal and I kind of dug deep into it and created a program model for K3 to help those little ones make sure that they're reading by third grade. How do, how do K through three kids enroll in the program? How do you get them into the program, first of all? The first thing we want to make sure is that we, we see where they're at. So And that's your youngest? That is kindergarten. our youngest. Kindergarten. You okay. have to have attended mm -hmm. one day of kindergarten to be a member. Great, okay. So, so and they're pay what happens is word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So for kids to join us, they right. come... Um, often their parents were club. You know, as you said, we're in an institution in this community. We've been around for a lot of years. So we have parents that bring their kids because they were club members. Schools do referrals. All the schools in Minneapolis and St. Paul will drop kids off. So parents choose Boys and Girls Club for their after school drop off point with busing. Um, and we do a lot of work in the schools to recruit, get kids excited about coming. Um, and that was a big thing for mm -hmm. us too with our academic programming. It had to be fun and engaging <coughs> um, and not stressful and not feel like school. So our model is really about meeting the kids where they're at and setting up a kind of Montessori-like atmosphere, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but really checking in with kids when they first arrive so that they can feel good about it. And that's our K-3 model. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of fourth through sixth graders also that come on the buses. Um, our teens, it's word of mouth. Mm -hmm. It's really digging deep into providing programs and opportunities for kids that teens want. So we do a lot of focus groups um, and spend times, even Crystal and I, even though we're working on the admin side of things, spent a lot of time working with teens to ask them what they want, mm -hmm. what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. So we built out a teen, what we call our teen pathway model um, that provides programming in spaces that 
they're interested in. And that's where Comcast as a partner was really important. Teen, teens want technology. Uh-huh. Well, and even our little ones did. And mm -hmm. they, so the MyDot Futures, which Comcast offers us through our Boys and Girls Clubs of America mm -hmm. um, partnership, really gets kids that strong base in technology. Mm -hmm. So the badging, the experiences that they're doing are on a level where our kids are able to create some new innovative technology. It's got them excited about the coding programs that mm -hmm. Crystal's been able to build out with mm -hmm. some of the girls programming. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all about engagement. Mm -hmm. It's all about what they're interested in and having really high expectations of our youth. Um, we have full-time staff mm -hmm. in all of our programs across all of our eight clubs because we feel like that's the investment in someone that makes Boys and Girls Club a career sure. Sure. is also in really important for our work. Um, I know a lot of organizations do volunteer base for their work with mm -hmm. youth. Mm -hmm. um, because we're there between kindergarten and post-secondary, mm -hmm. it's really important that we have people that stay with us. How large an organization do you have? How many people work for you? Um, between 70 and 80, wow. um, and most of those are full-time okay. and benefited year-round positions. Mm -hmm. We're open year-round, so every day after school, we open as soon as school's out and we stay open till nine mm -hmm. for our teenagers. Seven and nine is teen time mm -hmm. only. Um, and then we're open 10 weeks in the summer from eight what, to five. What a wonderful resource for families. You know, Jerry Gamble <laughs> yes. is, a, is a, a legendary mm -hmm. resource and asset in my neighborhood. I live in North Minneapolis. I've been there for a generation, but Jerry Gamble is the gold standard yes. for community mm -hmm. engagement and for responsivity. And, and so talk about, if you would, uh, Crystal, how do you make the shift from the old maybe idea of uh, just a neighborhood hangout and not hang out in the negative sense, no. but a, a good place and a safe place to come. But going from that up to right. uh, being that plus a place that has a phenomenal intention of supporting academic and, um, and uh, character development. Uh, sure. I that. started yeah. my career at Derry Gamble as the education director shortly after teaching for 13 years. Mm -hmm. And for me, what was important was how do we make this education setting fun and engaging mm -hmm. and not feel like school after school. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the model really is the station model. And so we look at what members need in regards to reading and then we, we create the station model. So they're working on phonetic um, awareness, they're working on um, words, they're, they're working on reading and comprehension, but we're making it fun and hands-on. So. It's important that they're moving in that space, so it might be taking games like Twister and putting them into an education way so mm -hmm. that it, they're learning and moving at the same time. Um, social emotional learning, we, if we're not working on that, we can't even get to the education piece. So mm -hmm. for me, it's really important that we take the time to figure out how kids are feeling, mm -hmm. how their days are, but even go further than that, but how do we deal with our emotions? Mm -hmm. So zones of regulation and learning how to regulate our emotions mm -hmm. when our emotions might be misfiring. Mm -hmm. So that's really important to the work we do and it's very intentional. So once we can work through that, then we can get to the academic space. You've got particular challenges though in some inner city communities mm -hmm. where uh, no matter what uh, good is happening during the day at school and what benefit you're adding to that child's experience mm -hmm. after school, uh, the child may be going home to a, a, a home of complete and total uh, havoc and dysfunction. How do you mm -hmm. compensate? How do you still embrace the potential that the child has and recognize that uh, he or she isn't to blame for the dysfunction at home, mm -hmm. but deserves uh, peace and deserves right. to advance? Mm -hmm. What do you do with that? I think it's important that they have that sense of belonging. That club is not just a club, it's a, it's, it's second, a family, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. to speak. And I think that goes into that social emotional learning and really making sure there's a sense of belonging and recognizing members when they do something great. Mm -hmm. We're very incentive based, mm -hmm. not right away you do something and get something, but more working towards, mm -hmm. yeah. um, working and towards that goal and then being able to reward them for that. So I think that's been really important, mm -hmm. but what else would you well, say? Well, I think, too, the positive messages to home. Mm -hmm. 
working mm -hmm. as a partner, what we're finding is we need to be an asset to the parents as well. Right. So we start off every first part of the school year, every first part of summer with orientations, asking parents what they need, mm -hmm. getting feedback, because often the stressors in that family are because they're socioeconomic. Mm -hmm. And so what happens for that parent, they need to feel mm -hmm. that they have a trusted partner in Boys and Girls Club right. through that process. And there still are situations, the trauma, mm -hmm. things right. that our kids have dealt with, and I'm, I've been there I ran as well. I, I was on Northside for a long time. Mm -hmm. So in our clubs, we found partners to do the work around trauma care. So Pastor Gillespie comes in once a week and mm -hmm. works with our youth over at Gamble. Mm -hmm. We find people like that. They can go above and beyond what the core normal programming is mm -hmm. to take a deeper dive into that work or, ref or refer on. We're also, we've learned to be really patient. So mm -hmm. we spent a lot of time training our staff around this work and it was being more responsive to our kids' needs mm -hmm. because the kids also act up. Mm -hmm. Um, and we took on a whole new, we created a positive climate response. Like It's kind of our culture, our new culture at mm -hmm. the club. And we've seen a dramatic shift in negative behaviors. Right. So our staff left last summer, sad to see summer go away. And I'm telling you, 22 years, I've never seen staff be sad at the end of summer to see it over. Okay. For the first time ever, they said that it was the most amazing summer because we started from the positive. So that helps parents, mm -hmm. it helps kids, it helps mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. And really it's the expectation right. that all kids can be successful. Right. And yes, stuff happens and that's, right. um, Crystal talked about the zones of regulation. It's just all this language around social emotional learning that really right. you can start to use on a daily basis. Mm -hmm telling kids it's okay to be angry. Mm -hmm. We're gonna talk about it though. Mm -hmm. We're gonna talk mm -hmm. about what that should look like. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with being angry mm -hmm. versus where it works for you mm -hmm. and how do you move yourself out of it? That had a dramatic change for our staff. They feel supported by us. Mm -hmm. They feel supported to be able to work with the kids and take them to that next level and being able to accomplish things. I think family engagement is really important mm -hmm. to us too and we've been striving to really make that a priority in our club. So it's important for us that we do this work with families. So it's really the member, the parents, and us working together. So we have recognition nights where we come in and after we do testing with our reading program, we invite families to come in. We, we gave out coffee cups that thank you for supporting mm -hmm. us in our um, literacy program, but really reaching out to them that they're part of this. Um, with their child, so that's been really positive as well. We're out of time. It goes so quickly. Oh, oh my <laughs> this goodness. Is amazing, but you know what? Uh, I want you to close on inviting our viewers and listeners, and this will be an insight news, our readers, to know how they can support the work at the Boys and Girls Club of Twin Cities. What can individuals do, families mm -hmm. do? What can companies, businesses do to uh, add value to the important work that you have undertaken? Absolutely. Well, going on our website, which is boysandgirls.org, mm -hmm. there's an opportunity to donate, to connect with any of us, to Crystal or myself. Mm -hmm. Come out to a club, get involved. You can volunteer. volunteer. We're always looking for support, and I think the most important thing is we want to make sure that our growth of our seniors graduating doubles by 2025, and that is going to take more funding, mm -hmm. And but also it's going to take us going into new communities. So if you have resources and you have a need, that's another thing you can call us about. We'd be happy to come and check it out. Thank, thank you, you so, thank you so much. much. So Crystal uh, Beter, thank you for your service. And Terrell Brum, CEO of Big uh, Boys uh, and Girls Club of Twin Cities. Say it right now. There okay. you go. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you both so very much for being thank here. You. Thank you for your work. This and thank great. you for the uh, your service to community, service to humanity. Absolutely. I'm Thank Al you. McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. Uh, this edition of Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by Comcast, 
Comcast working to bridge the digital divide through internet essentials and partnering with organizations across the Twin Cities to help make our region an even better place to live, work, and play. I'm pleased to have as guest for this program Nancy Brady. She's president of the Storied Neighborhood House in St. Paul and her colleague Georgie Wynn. Uh, Nancy Brady joined Neighborhood House as president in 2014. Uh, she was returning then to the agency where uh, from 2003 and to 2006 she led the successful capital campaign that funded the construction of Neighborhood House's home, the Paul and Sheila Wellstone Center for Community Building. Nancy has more than 25 years of leadership experience in an array of areas including strategic planning, fundraising, volunteer engagement, marketing and communications, program development, project management, and community relations. She's served on the senior leadership, leadership teams at Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity for eight years, and she was responsible there for fundraising, volunteerism, and marketing communications. She's got an MBA from New York University, a BA in psychology from University of Illinois. She's a member of the Leadership St. Paul class of 2004, and she served on the board of directors at uh, Minnesota Communities Caring for Children. I think it's a name for that organization that used to be called Prevent Child Abuse Minnesota, mm -hmm. I think. You were there for two terms, uh, including serving as its chair. Uh, she's currently serving on the board of directors of the Metropolitan Alliance for Connected Communities. And uh, Georgie Wynn uh, is the food support manager at Neighborhood House. And uh, you know, she's overseeing the two food markets. They've got a nutrition assistance program for seniors. And uh, there's also the traditional program called SNAP. SNAP is uh, known as a food stamp program. And the second part is the fresh produce distribution program. Prior to working at Neighborhood House, Georgie worked to reduce the prevalence of preterm birth and infant mortality at the Minnesota Department of Health. She's got a master's degree in public health from the University of Minnesota, specializing in maternal and child health. She's a passionate uh, advocate for social justice and health equity. Uh, that drives her work in direct service, she says. She strives to improve family and community health by addressing socioeconomic barriers. Outside of work, uh, Georgie is busy exploring restaurants in Twin Cities and getting inspiration for home decor on HGTV. Uh, this is the most fun part. It says if she's challenged in Harry Potter trivia, she will win. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so you can find also find her painting canvases and wood pieces for her uh, online shop, Etsy shop, Etsy shop. It's called Inspired Co. Uh, guys, thank you both for being here. It's such a pleasure to meet you. And I want to simply begin by uh, reiterating my sense of how important the work, the mission, the history is of Neighborhood House. But I want to ask you uh, to give kind of the elevator speech vision of the organization and the value it brings to community in St. Paul and Twin Cities. Great. Thank you so much. Sure. We are so delighted to be here and, and, and thank you for creating that opportunity and thanks to Comcast as well. So Neighborhood House has been around for 122 years. We were founded in 1897 and what most people don't know is that in addition to working on the west side, we actually serve six neighborhoods in the city of St. Paul. And we work with members of the community who are um, seeking to meet their basic needs and also to really improve their social and their economic well-being, to dream about the life they really want to lead and work towards achieving that. And we are designed to do that with them. We walk with people on their journey. They lead the way, we support, and we make sure they have the resources and the support that they need to get where they want to go. Um, we uh, work with them in such a way that as they improve their lives as a whole family, working with multiple members of a family across programs and over time, they are also, and with our support, we are also improving the quality of life in the neighborhoods where they live, which are the neighborhoods that we serve. A critical strategy is understanding this the two-way street. Not only are you helping people, but people are helping 
the community, helping Absolutely. build a neighborhood in the community that makes sense, that thrives actually. How does that work? Well, for us, the first thing we do is that we believe in the strength of our participants. We don't look at our participants as people just with needs, because frankly, we all have needs. Um, we look at people with strengths. So we help people build on their own strengths, and a lot of the way we do our work is inviting people to support each other and inviting people to get involved in, in identifying and addressing barriers to success in their neighborhoods mm -hmm. And, um, and, and supporting each other outside the doors of neighborhood house in their own neighborhoods. And as people gain confidence, which is part of what they gain, uh, our mission is helping people build knowledge, skills, and confidence, then they actually help build um, the quality of life in their neighborhood and they strengthen everyone around them. Absolutely, and I would just add that a lot of our participants and families, once they do feel comfortable, they do come back to Neighborhood House and they like to work within the community to help others, their neighbors, their friends, their family, and invite them to Neighborhood House and become participants as well. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's simultaneous. They can be a participant and a volunteer Absolutely. at the same time. With the 100 year history, uh, you've obviously seen and know something about shifting demographics. And when you started 100 years ago, what was the world like? If you can reflect on that. And what's the world like now? What things are the same and what is different? Uh, All right, so some of the things that are the same, but uh, let me start with that history piece, as mm -hmm. you asked. Um, so when we were founded, um, we were founded by the women of Mount Zion Temple. And Mount Zion Temple continues to be involved in Neighborhood House today. And we are very grateful for that. Um, and they were seeking to help uh, Jewish people who were escaping the pogroms in Russia and had found their way to St. Paul and they were working to help these people build safe, stable, rewarding lives in our community mm -hmm. and to be, become really integrated and part of the community, um, bringing their gifts and also receiving our gifts, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, and that's true today. We work with a lot of new immigrants and refugees, but we also work with anybody in our community who is seeking to um, make contributions to the community and to improve their social and economic well-being. But again, in each of those ways, what stayed the same is the idea that people have strengths and people um, are self-directed. They get to pick where they want to go and what they want to accomplish. And um, so, and they get to say what they need and want from us as well as what they want to give. Uh, Georgia, you're working with food, with the yep. food programs. Mm -hmm. Talk about those, please. Sure, so you kind of touched on the overview of the programs that I see at Neighborhood House, um, but at you know, within the food support program, that is where we see the majority of our participants come in. It is, I would say, the gateway point to Neighborhood House. Um, and a lot of people know that we are available for food support. Um, but one of the great parts about the program is it's also an ability for us to connect them to the other resources we have within Neighborhood House. So when they come in, we have an intake process and we can engage with them and also just gauge what their needs are and work with the families to determine if they need internal or external resources and we can refer them. Um, so we offer, you know, a lot of adult education classes, youth programs, um, we preschool. have preschool classes and um, so many opportunities with the Neighborhood House and being a part of the food support program where we're able to bridge the gap and make the connections for a lot of people who are um, unaware of the other services that we provide. Um, but one of the biggest things about the food support program that we do um, is really addressing the need in the community. Um, we recently partnered with a local high school who currently they said that 90% of their students are eligible um, for free and reduced lunch. That is an alarming number. That is such a high number of students. And knowing that that need is in our community, we really hope to make an impact. Um, and in 2018, the food support program distributed over um, one million pounds of food. Do you think about how much food that is? A lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but the need is still out there, so it's wonderful yeah. to be a part well, of it. Well, and the other thing about our um, program is it, it has a heavy, heavy focus on healthy nutrition. Mm -hmm. We know that it, it is not only is food insecurity an issue, but healthy food is an issue. Right. Um, some of the healthiest foods are the least available and the most expensive. 
And so we work hard to make sure that our food markets, our fresh produce distributions, all of the different ways, we have school, we have pantries inside schools. We work really hard to make sure that the food is the food that people want, culturally specific food, the food that is their comfort food, they know how to cook, they know their kids will eat it, mm -hmm. but also that they have access to really healthy food and one of the future things we're really working towards is a lot more nutrition education and healthy cooking education um, and, and within cultural mm -hmm. norms. So how do we help people c cook the foods that they love that are, that are part of their heritage and culture mm -hmm. and do it in a way that actually promotes the health of their, their whole family? How have you been effective in engaging uh, partners in this work? Um, we mentioned Comcast as a sponsor. How do you uh, connect with an organization like that and bring them uh, a value proposition where yeah. they see uh, in their uh, corporate and business interest the mm -hmm. importance of working with neighborhood health mm -hmm. and organizations like you? So um, Comcast is a great example because their relationship with us is very multifaceted. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the ways that's, I think, fairly obvious most people think about is that they make contributions from their foundations. And uh, having unrestricted funding that we can use where we see the need is greatest and that allows us to fulfill um, the, the needs that are coming from our community and, and, and as opposed to being directed by somebody that says you can only spend it this way and then if that's not exactly the way that we think it's needed or that our community is telling us that's not important, this is, mm -hmm. those kind of funds. And Comcast has been very generous with unrestricted funding and it makes a huge difference. But the other way is, is having their, their um, the members of their company get involved as volunteers. The Comcast Cares Day that really comes out and is, is part of it. Um, and, and just a number of ways, their Internet Essentials program, um, in our adult education and in our youth programming, we, we have Comcast members, and we also have a Comcast member on our board, so the volunteerism that comes through. And then another way is things like this, where, where companies and individuals as well have a particular expertise or skill set or access to some sort of resource that isn't cash, mm -hmm. but that they can bring that to the picture and that together with Neighborhood House, we can work with the community to make sure the community gets what they need and they want in order to um, really build those safe, stable, rewarding lives in our community that they, they're striving for. You have to talk about your uh, phenomenal and well-used facility. Uh, that institution, the building itself, the campus, is a, a great place, a great meeting place. It's a place to convene. Talk about it. If you yeah, will. so the Wellstone Center is actually a social enterprise. And since not everybody knows what the heck is a social enterprise, what it really is, it's a little mini business that generates actual positive revenue flow that then supports a, a cause. Hmm. And it also helps to serve our mission. And in the case of the Wellstone Center, um, the, the building is a venue. It allows people to come in from the community and have a place to gather for meetings and celebrations and a wide variety of events. So we run it as a venue and people can, can pay to use the space and then um, the rates and the revenue that comes in helps uh, maintain the building and, and keep it a resource for our community. And so, yes, it can work for a business, and a business can hold a meeting there, and we appreciate that very much. But it's also a community space. So there are four um, local theater companies that would call us home. There are a couple of congregations that use the building on the weekend as the home for their community. So we're, we're, um, there's a, um, a veterans group that mm -hmm. meets there. Mm -hmm. So there's a wide variety of ways the building is a resource for the community as well as it is a revenue generating. And if I might, I'm gonna go on to, we have a brand new social enterprise at sure. Neighborhood House Please. that isn't in the Wellstone Center, mm -hmm. and it's called Beatingful. Mm -hmm. And it is a coffee shop in the new Osborne 370 building in downtown St. Paul. The building used to be the Ecolab headquarters, so mm -hmm. I'm inviting everyone to come into Beatingful. Mm -hmm and please have breakfast, lunch, or coffee mm -hmm. in Beatingful. We're open Monday through Friday, seven to five. And the, the, the uh, baristas, mm -hmm. um, the bar staff, are neighborhood house participants yeah. building job skills. Beaningful? And beaningful, like meaningful beaningful. with a B. <laughs> and, um, and so please, please, please come and yeah. do that. And, and uh, it's a brand new business. It's really, really new. Um, but the ultimate goal is that 
it will not only help people build job skills, mm -hmm. but it will also help uh, Neighborhood House have a revenue source that mm -hmm. helps fund all of Neighborhood House programming. Well, there's something important about sustainability. Mm -hmm. How do you sustain good work? And how do you figure out ways to make it, <coughs> excuse me, so that organizations uh, can survive and thrive as they serve communities? And I think you're moving, and you've always moved on that path with the model mm -hmm. uh, for your social uh, inter enterprise. And this is one more step in that direction. Let me uh, close this interview with uh, thanking you both for being here, but inviting you to invite uh, community and business people to both use the service, be a, uh, a part of the um, uh, services that are provided, but also to provide service as well. Because you're saying this is about both sides of the equation. Nobody's just on one side of the street. We're all in building a neighborhood, a community, a resource together. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I'll make my beginning invitation, and then I'd love to have Georgie talk a little bit about food, because as she mentioned, that's where most people begin. But it's not the only place you can begin. So if you need and want or are interested in either um, using one of the Neighborhood House services and everything we do at Neighborhood House other than the Wellstone Center is and Beaningful mm -hmm. are free, mm -hmm. um, but we have preschool in two neighborhoods. We have family centers in six neighborhoods. Four of them are inside elementary schools, but people in the community surrounding the schools are welcome to come. We help, we're, we're Minsure navigators. We can get people connected to SNAP benefits. Yeah. We can um, you know, help people with housing crises um, and a number of other things um, to help family stability. We have um, community baby showers, and we teach people about how to work with their landlords and what their rights and responsibilities mm -hmm. are. So lots of ways you can get involved. Um, we also are very interested in people that want to come to us and support each other. So um, we have adult education. We teach GED as well as English and civics, and um, we partner with Minnesota Computers for Schools um, on uh, uh, Internet classes. Um, the Wellstone Center includes Parks and Rec. We partner with a lot of local schools on our, our youth programming, and one thing I definitely want to mention is that we have a program right now that's very similar to one the Boys and Girls Clubs have, and I know that you've worked with Terrell Brum from there as well, but it, it is a program where in small group and one-on-one, -on -one, we will help teenagers bring up their reading skills. Hmm. And um, if, if we have teenagers out there, middle school, high school students that are struggling with reading and really want to read better, they can come to us, and that's another point of entry. Great. And then Such food is our fabulous point of entry just about anywhere in any of those neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah. So we have a couple different locations for the two food markets that we talked about. One of them is at the Wellstone Center, um, and that's where we see the majority of our participants. Mm -hmm. And then we also have um, a smaller food market that's in the Highland Park area. Um, and recently at the Wellstone Center, um, we did a survey maybe I wouldn't say recently, but about two years ago, and we mm -hmm. wanted to hear from participants about what they would like to see from us, and they said they were coming to us for fresh produce, as um, Nancy mentioned earlier, is one of the most expensive um, parts of groceries is buying fresh produce, and so we implemented um, a new program called Bonus Thursdays, where participants can come an extra time a month to get you know the other essentials that they need to really get them through um, the next time they can you know go grocery shopping or come to get their next um, shop at the food market. Um, which is great that we're able to address that need. And then we also have the fresh produce distributions, which are year-round, um, such an important part of the food support program. And um, Comcast is also involved, and we re um, soon, I think maybe in two weeks, we're doing the Comcast Cares Day at Metro State um, for the fresh produce distribution. But the main goal of that program is to get out um, as many pounds of food as possible to Wonderful. participants yeah, and families. Um, it's just and for those of you who would like to donate to food, yeah, thirty-six dollars can feed a, a family of four for a week. Right. Yeah. Nobody out here can go to mm -hmm. Sam's Club or Costco or wherever and buy what we can buy for thirty-six dollars. And, and um, because of the food banks like Second Harvest mm -hmm. and uh, the food group, yeah. we can um, we can use really thirty-six dollars right. pretty pretty uh, phenomenally really for healthy healthy foods. Everybody so. can mm -hmm. help. Everybody, yeah. can Everybody can help. help. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody can help. Everybody has a gift. 
Right. If everybody le you know leverages their gifts for every for themselves and others, mm -hmm. we're all going to be a better place. Listen, I want to thank both of you so very much for what you do, but thank you for spending time with me today on Conversations with Alan McFarland, Nancy Brady, President of Neighborhood House uh, here in St. Paul, and Georgie Wynn, who runs the Food Support Program at Neighborhood House. Thank you both so much for what you do. Thank you for being here. Continued success. Thank you so much. Thank you for having I'm us. Al I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. Support for Conversations with Al McFarland was provided by Old National Bank, Comcast, Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance, and North American Banking Company.